So skill number two, embrace and accept the adoption experience. Babies do remember. And this is hard for people to understand. Early separation does impact the brain and behavior for that child. The experience of early loss does leave a footprint on the brain and the body, which shows up in the present as a behavior and an integrative body psychotherapy. A fault or fracture occurs to the somatic sense of self because the body absorbs trauma. If you haven't read the book or listened to the audio book, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk talks about how the body absorbs an experience, even though the first three years of life is pre-verbal, which means that the child cannot access a cognitive memory of an experience. They absorb and feel the memory of the experience in their bodies. And so a lot of adopted children can often appear clingy or avoidant because they're afraid to trust the relationship because there's a feeling, a sense in their body, you're going to leave me too because my early caregiver, my first mother left me. So how can I feel secure in my body and trusting that you're not going to leave me too? There's a push-pull. And even in the adult adoptee support groups that I've run, there's this push-pull. And whenever I explain this to adoptees, they go, oh, I feel that. I want to bring them close, but only so close because I don't feel secure and trusting the relationship is going to be there. So we need a lot of consistency. All the behavior of this push-pull is a healthy response to an unhealthy threat in the body. So a parent's absence can feel like an abandonment. Just yesterday, I was working with a child. He's 11. And he says, when my mom goes away, I don't trust that she's going to return. He's 11. He was adopted at birth. At birth. This is a felt sense. Your love, feeling loved, can also equate to feeling the loss. There's oxymorons, there's parallels here. That's why there's only so much that a child can absorb at a time. Bruce Perry, a well-known therapist in the field of trauma, talks about children need experiences in doses, doses at a time. They can't just take in all the love that a parent has to give. They can receive it dose at a time. And I know it can be frustrating for parents, but accept and understand, and you will be able to tolerate how difficult not only this is for you, but for your child. So this early pre-verbal life experience can bring up perceived abandonment, not feeling wanted or lovable, lack of trust in relationships, whether real or imagined. And it manifests in behavior as that fight and flight also called a traumatic grief reaction. All behavior is a communication of an unmet need. Think about that. All behavior is a communication of an unmet need. So your child is actually trying to avoid these intense feelings that feel painful and unsafe in the body. So triggers can't just be turned off. It's like a light switch, on and off. Sensations will happen. And if you think about the five senses in sensations, there could be a touch that triggers, whoa, this is too much. This is intense. There can be a sound that's too intense. There could be a taste that's too intense. There can be a smell or something they see. Thoughts and feelings in the body and the mind connection have no rhyme or rhythm when they show up. And they're showing up because they need to be, they need attention. They need the parent to understand, oh, I see they're having a big feeling right now. And I'm going to help regulate, soothe, and nurture. Because there's a phrase that also came out of our support groups. What's hysterical, we must assume is historical. It has something 
to do with the past, an unmet need. Because what gets repressed in the body and in the mind, we are always attempting to express out, heal, work through. So an intervention that's an attachment-based intervention, actually created by Daniel Hughes, I say the father of attachment. He's written many books. I highly recommend you read his books. He says three times a day, when your child and teen doesn't expect it, give him or her a loving, gazing look, smiling. Just smile. Be present like you are absolutely in love with them. No words needed. That nonverbal communication is a download. You don't have to say anything. It's your presence. It's your body affirming and validating their life and their experience. I cannot tell you as an adult adoptee, we need a lot of validation. There is a part of us, and I'm also an internal family systems therapist and object relations. There are parts of us, and there is a part of the adoptee experience where they don't feel acknowledged. They feel like they don't exist. Because when you are separated from your birth family, how does a baby explain this? How does a child explain this? Now I'm no longer in the mind of my birth mother. Whose mind am I in? I'm in the mind of my new caregiver. We need to feel that felt sense. Someone's looking out for me. Someone's watching over me. Someone is with me. So that's why this intervention, three times a day, if you have a child who has attachment challenges, I highly recommend you do this. And it will help you to, our brains are Velcro for negative experiences. So we're often looking at what's wrong. And we need to train our brains to look at what's working, what's love, what's important, what matters is the relationship with my child. This is a clip from In Utero. This is a full length movie. Here's a five minute clip about understanding the in utero experience. Before you even receive your child, they could have trauma in the womb. Intrauterine life is not a paradise, as some people try to make us believe. This substance, which is uh, the potential of a human being, feels every little feeling that the mother feels. We are the receiver of all the happiness and of all the difficulties of our parents. This is something that we're just beginning to explore gene by gene. We're really pushing back that time frame to say that there are factors environmentally that happen prenatally. Human beings are affected by the environment as soon as they have an environment. And that means as soon as we implant it in the womb. In our society, there's so much rushing. You're so busy, everything going, going, going. Fetuses of mothers who are high anxious, they're showing differences almost, we want to say, in temperament. We see reduced brain volume, reduced gray matter density. People are conceiving, carrying, and birthing children under increasingly stressed conditions. Stress that affected one generation will be played out very exactly in the next generation. People have been through wars, famine, disasters of all sorts. When we see dysfunction in people, we're actually seeing the imprint of that early experience. An adult trauma is really a fetal trauma. And this has been the missing piece, the foundation for our whole life. When you come to a point of knowing what is the cause of all this, when you have an answer, like the door opens. Depressed mothers, or even worse, um, schizophrenic mothers, they are not in synchrony. The baby is getting the message that there's something wrong with it. Its prefrontal cortex is not going to be tuned properly. So that baby is going to develop a kind of depressive personality. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? 
Oh, yes. Oh. monkeys tell us more about the severe effects of infant deprivation. The ones that were reared in isolation just don't behave normally when they're finally given a playmate. They rarely touch. And when they do, the contact's surprisingly vicious. Children who are emotionally inhibited will become dysfunctional adults. They will have difficulty learning and will be more hostile. And that starts right in the womb. When the brain begins to be organized, um, genetically speaking, each neuron is destined for a certain place where it will eventually end up. Neurons, brain cells, are the information processing units of the brain. And they make connections and they organize themselves into functional networks. Every second of prenatal life, 50,000 new neurons are being produced. Every second. There's not a machine in the world that can duplicate that. When you have all those neurons being produced, they are very vulnerable. And smallest, smallest influence will make a huge sort of imprint on, on those neurons, on the neural circuits. If there is chronic stress, the woman is constantly obsessing about something or worrying about something, more and more stress hormones like cortisone is being pushed into the bloodstream. When you have too much cortisone in the brain itself, then the nerve cells will be interfered with in their passage, and they may even be destroyed. We were the first, or amongst the first, to glimpse inside at the brain becoming wired up. With this new safe MRI technology, we're observing large-scale systems. What we see in infants exposed to stress in utero is reduced brain volume, reduced gray matter density. So if you are less dense in those regions, that suggests that there are less processors available. We also see reductions in hippocampal volume and increase in amygdala volume. The hippocampus is critically important for learning and memory. The amygdala is very important for emotional processing, responding to emotional information. Now, why we think those are particularly important during fetal development is, first of all, they begin to be developed very early. Disruption in those areas is also associated with higher risk for emotional psychopathology or uh, neuropsychiatric illness. If the mother is upset, if she has a very high level of neurohormones, if she has very high level of stress hormones, all of those things will be passed to the baby. There are all kinds of feelings coming from the mother. All kinds, anxieties, depression, fears about everything. Let's be clear, mothers love their children. So do fathers. But there are these subtle, unconscious things, see, that this mother is dealing with in her life. Say she may be in a tough marriage, but she gets pregnant. Well, part of her may want the baby, and part of her may really say, gee, this is not a good time for a baby. In fact, this is going to be very hard. And a, a baby may get a lot of that. That little bit of stuff is feeling all that without any way of communicating. It just absorbs, it just holds it. And that's what it gets for nine months. What comes to mind is the um, confusion, if you can speak of that, in, in, a, in, a, in a fetus, um, a developing human being. Whose mother is conflicted who wants a child perhaps, but is afraid of having a child, who wants to love, but is themselves very afraid and very stressed. So the kid is getting a very confusing message about the world, that this world wants me, this world doesn't want me.
one adoptee that I've worked with, she had extreme bouts of high anxiety states. I said, I want you to go back and sit with your parents who adopted you and ask them if they know about your experience in utero, because we couldn't make sense. There was nothing that had happened to her in her life that was that would equate and connect the dots to these high states of anxiety. And she comes back to me and she says, you'll never believe it, but my parents told me my birth mother did cocaine during her pregnancy. When she heard this information, of course, it was painful for her. And at the same time, it was settling for her. She could now make sense of, now I understand why I feel this way. And we were able to work through that and calm the nervous system. And she was a 42-year-old woman. We do need to understand that there are in utero experiences that could be impacting the lifelong mental health nervous system of that person. And that's considered traumatic. She was in high states of anxiety in utero. And she came into the world and didn't understand. Her parents didn't understand because at that time they didn't have the knowledge we have today. I hope this is helping you expand your window of thinking and understanding how trauma is related, not to the adoption, but the pre-adoption experience that a child can encounter. So when there is separation trauma, that's also considered traumatic for any baby to leave all that they know. This is the child's homeostasis, the infants. So when they leave this experience, first birth mother, and then they go into the arms of their new caregiver, that's a transition. So instead of the very common dismissive mantra chanted to babies, oh, it's okay, it's okay, you don't need to cry. I lived with my birth parents for the first 15 months of my life. My mother had mental illness. It was deemed unsafe for me to live with her. Ended up going into foster care. And my foster parents, they told me, you cried for days. I cried for days. I said, how many days? They said, like three or four days. I was 15 months old. We tend to, when infants cry, especially in adoption and foster care. And I was a kid who cried a lot. That's how I communicated my unmet need. I was grieving, mourning. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You're okay. You're okay. It's, you don't need to cry. That actually made it worse for me. It's like telling my brain, don't think about a white bear. Go. Don't think about it. It actually makes it more profound. The more I thought, the more I tried not to think about my grief, the more profound it became. So this is how the brain works. So the thoughtful and knowledgeable adoptive parent can gently croon to their baby in distress as, I understand you miss your mother. You had a connection. You miss your connection. You've lost someone very important. And I understand. I'm not the mom you expected. I don't smell like her. I don't sound like her. I'm a different mom and I love you. And I'm going to stay right here with you. And I've had parents even tear themselves. Why? Because you're feeling your child's grief. You're mourning with them. And there is a quote by an adoptive parent, I've learned to grieve with my child. And it's profound because they're having a loss of separation experience to all that they know. And some kids never see their birth families again. I'm a big advocate for open adoption and open foster care, which means I've worked with children who've been in multiple placements, some placements where they didn't form an attachment, but some they did. And they are grieving not only their birth families, they're grieving their foster families. So we go back and find those foster families that the child formed an attachment to that they're still grieving and seeking out. We find that foster family. We educate the foster family. This child does need to see you again and know that it's not their fault that they had to leave your home, that there were circumstances at that time that that child could not stay at any foster placement, especially yours at that time. It wasn't about the child, but your relationship was what matters. It's so healing for them to know that they were loved. They did matter and they still are loved and they still matter. Here's another phrase. I really see you. You're in distress. I understand. 
You had some scary and painful things happen to you while I wasn't with you. I'm very sorry. Saying this out loud can be tremendously healing for the infant to hear, as well as for the parent to connect with the loss. It will allow, allow the baby to cry and mourn, which helps the parent gain compassion for the loss of separation. 